successful musician in the classical repertoire, although also jazz and pop. Um, and he played bass. And on the very first day of first grade at PS11 Queens, Sunnyside Queens, um, now more than 10 years ago, I mean, you know, like uh, 60 years ago, um, 60 is more than 10, right? Yeah. Um, I learned the most important lesson of my life, which is uh, the teacher went around the, the classroom asking everybody what their father did for a living. And one kid's father was a plumber, one, one kid's father was an electrician, this is Queens, and everybody kind of talked like this. And my turn came and I said my father was a musician, and I remember the teacher saying, no, 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 we're not talking about hobbies, we're talking about professions. I, I said, well, my father's a professor, you mean he gets paid to make music? He said, he actually does, yes. So she said, oh, you mean like weddings and bar mitzvahs? I said, well, I don't think he's played any of those gigs in quite a while since he was like a high school kid. He, uh, he, he, he works for NBC. He's with the NBC Symphony, Tos uh, or Symphony Orchestra under Arturo Toscanini, which was a very big thing. Um, you know, there's Sunday night broadcasts in the old radio era, you know, were uh, like the, the hottest item on, on radio. And um, so she was kind of impressed by that. And then she asked me what instrument he plays. And I said, bass. And she said, what's that? What do you mean? And so I explained what the bass was, that it looked like a violin, but it was much, much larger. It stood on the floor and uh, the musician stood behind it. And she said, oh, oh. I know what you're talking about. That's that's called a cello, she said. So I tried to explain the string family to her, uh, the violin, the viola, the cello, and the bass. And um, the reason I knew that wasn't because I was precocious, although I probably was precocious, but it was like the same reason the, the kid whose father was a plumber knew the difference between a hex wrench and a pipe wrench, and the kid whose father was an electrician maybe knew the difference between a voltmeter and an ammeter, I'm just guessing. Um, well, I could see she didn't like that. She said, wait a second, it looks like a violin, but it's much bigger. She said, that's called a cello. So I said the smartest thing I've ever said in my life. It's been downhill for me since that day in 1950 or 51, whenever it was. Um, I said, oh, okay, it's a cello, but I knew it wasn't a cello. And I knew, uh, more importantly, I knew two things. One, people in positions of authority, they don't know what they're talking about. And what an authority, you know, any, to a kid, a six-year-old, a first grader, uh, on the first day of school, any grown-up is, um, is an adult. I'm sorry, is a, any adult is, a, uh, is an authority. And a teacher is especially an authority, you know, an important authority. So here is... Um, this person of great authority and she doesn't know what she's talking about she's just wrong first of all second of all if you try to enlighten her and and tell her uh, the truth inform her of just simple facts gets mad at you so f from that moment on um i've had a disdain and a kind of disregard for authority and the irony in my life is that now i'm in a position of authority uh, people are afraid to tell me what they thought of a movie because they might get it wrong. I just came from the pool. I'm an obsessive, compulsive swimmer. I swim every day. And I met a, somebody was telling me about a movie they just saw. And I said, um, so how was it? He said, it's, it's interesting. It's certainly something that you want to see. And I said to him, I don't think you like that movie. I'm, my impression is you didn't like that movie and that you're afraid to say that to me because I'm a professor and I know what, what the good movies are and what the bad movies are. But if somebody says to me, you got to see this movie. Um, oh, what a movie I saw. You know, Okay, but somebody says to me, well, it certainly is an important film to see. And, you know, I just in the inflection of the tone, I can tell that they really didn't like the movie. And I can't imagine anything worse than people having to pretend to like things that they don't, <laughs> they don't really like. And it's been my privilege and my experience over the years, because I travel all around the world, all around North America and all around the world, um, teaching, screenwriting, and giving master classes and lecturing and consulting also with film companies and with uh, national film development corporations and so on of various uh, countries. Um, I, I actually give people permission to admit 
they've been pretending to like certain movies that they really don't like. So, uh, hence, first name basis here. We're trying to debauch our own authority. We want to support our students as best we can, but we cannot tell them what's right and what's wrong. I give a lot of advice to students. I also give advice to faculty and who ask me. And I, uh, Not long ago, a, a teacher came to me and said, um, what are you? And he gave this writer notes, and uh, she just ignored them. She gives it back the new, the new draft, and she hasn't paid any attention to the notes at all. She seems to just reject these notes. And I said to the instructor, I said, you are too invested in this script. I mean, so what? She didn't follow your notes. Uh, she has the right to write as badly as she wants, if indeed that's what it is. And um, uh, you can't have a stake in in someone's script, you know, I mean, everybody has to go their own way. So that's what we're trying to do here is have some kind of overarching structure, but at the same time to maintain the freedom that artists have to have to, to do their art. If someone goes to see someone's film and the filmmaker asks their best friend or an audience member, what did you think? In the vein of being honest, do you tell them or do you try to save their feelings? What a good question. Uh, Generally, you lie. Um, what a lot of, to be honest, a lot of people who think they're being honest are really being hostile. They're resentful and they're jealous. Um, oh, there's an example of it that went around Hollywood uh, about a year ago, kind of went viral. It was called "No, I Won't Read Your Fucking Screenplay." That's what what it was called. It's about some guy who. Had, been asked to read somebody's script and told him what he thought was the, the truth. Um, you know, my sister is a very uh, well-known actor, and she was on a uh, um, a few years ago. I saw her on an episode of a series where she was a guest, and it was just the the most dreadful episode of a horrible series. Uh, and when it was all, all, when the, I saw the episode, what did I say to her? I said to her, "You looked beautiful." which she did and which she does. She's famously beautiful. She is a movie star and uh, looks, like a, <laughs> looks like a movie star. And, um, and I said, when you came on uh, the, uh, the screen, when you came on, you know, into the episode, the scenes that, that involved you, suddenly it was engaging and interesting and, and worthy. With, and all that is true. Instead of my saying to her, oh, how could you be associated with that garbage? Um, I mean, that's not her fault. What she did, she did very well. We do. We are upbeat here. This is a difference between us and some other institutions, including our sisters across town, my alma mater, where they are uh, rough and tough, tough love and all of that. Uh, and they really think, they like to beat up on artists, and that's what goes on a lot in a lot of arts education, not just in screenwriting. Um, and they argue across town that that's good training for Hollywood because you're going to deal with, have to deal with hard stuff in Hollywood. And we say three things to that. Bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. Uh, if somebody has the courage to put it on the page, um, you need to be generous. You need to be affirming. You need to be nourishing and, and loving and, you know, uh, uh, not hostile and, <laughs> and rude and belligerent. So what I will do if I read a really, really useless, worthless I mean, people send me scripts all the time. These are scripts that just come from recently from off campus. Um, and I don't know how to turn people down and say, no, I won't read your script. Um, I mean, I just consider myself so fortunate to cross paths with people who uh, are creative and have the courage to be creative and, and to write it down and offer it up for somebody to give an opinion about it. Uh, that that is not a burden, but a blessing in my life that people cross paths with me that way. For me, it's a, I consider it a blessing. Uh, when I get a really, really dreadful script, uh, I'll find something positive to say. Uh, you know, sometimes it's like being a uh, plastic surgeon with a burn victim looking for some a few cells to start a graft, you know, but um, there's always something that you, you could say that's positive. And, um, you know, uh, uh, and then mention that there are other issues that need to be visited here relative to this and that and the other thing. In my book, uh, Essentials of Screenwriting, I write about my experience with my father, 
whom I mentioned earlier, he played uh, with all of the greats of the last century, including Don Pablo Casals, the master cellist. Um, they say he's Spanish. He's actually, he would say he's Catalan. Um, and he lived in Puerto Rico. He would not live in Spain under Franco. Uh, and he lived in Puerto Rico. Uh, and I went to Puerto Rico to the Casals Festival. And there's a, uh, he's now long deceased, but they still have the Casals Festival. Back then he was alive. He wasn't playing cello, but he was conducting. And uh, I, I watched him teach. I saw him give some master classes, and the the artist would come in nervous. It's this is Casals, you know, um, the master cellist in the world um, in his in his day, and one of the all time masters of cello. So you'd see her play, and he would sit there and listen. And I grew up in the world of, of virtuoso world class music, and to me it sounded you didn't just walk in off the street to take a lesson. You know, there was a shingle that said music lessons. You know. <laughs> didn't work like that. You had to be really good to study with Casals. So to me, it sounded very, very good. She'd finish, and he would sit there, and he would nod sort of severely, um, and she'd be really nervous. You could just see it. And finally, he would say, and by the way, the first time I saw this, I thought it was spontaneous. Then I realized he does this every time exactly the same way. It's the way he works, the way he teaches. He would finally say, beautiful. Beautiful. And then you could see the shoulders. It's funny because my wife and I just saw Lynn Harrell and the uh, Philharmonic on Saturday night and it was beautiful. It was quite remarkable. Um, talk about cello, virtuoso celli, cellists. Um, and you could see the shoulders relax, you know, on, on, on the, the woman who was, on the man who was a student in question. And he'd be kind of watching out of the corner of his eye for that. And as soon as they did relax, then he would say as if it was an afterthought, but really it was clearly the first thing on his mind was perhaps even more beautiful if the intonation and the phrasing and the... Da, 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 da. He would really uh, take on the weaknesses and, and um, the shortcomings of it and so on. But he'd won the safety of the artist. She felt like he, he was on her side. And that is our guiding philosophy here. Uh, this is not an adversarial enterprise, and uh, certainly in the film school. And then film isn't an adversarial enterprise. A lot of writers will tell me, and they'll tell you, and they'll tell anybody, they stop people on the street and tell you that the bad thing about film, writing for film, is so many people come between you and the film, the final piece of work. That, um, And I say to them, that's not the downside, that's the upside, that's the fun of being in film, that you get to be part of a uh, an, uh, a family of artists and craftspeople and, and um, all different kinds of skills and diverse sorts of uh, talents uh, that come together to make this one thing which is the movie and um, uh, they may mess it up but more likely they'll make it even better than you imagined it could be and the trick is to not get into a uh, a turf a territorial struggle with them uh, not merely to tolerate that but to rejoice in that to embrace that to celebrate that to solicit that um so uh i forget where where we were going with that but oh i guess it has to do with with the fact of our point of view here at ucla the way we teach, we think teaching also ought to be not the faculty beating up on the students, but uh, everybody supporting everybody else. You know, uh, I've taught so much here over the last 35 years, but I've learned much more than I've taught, and my teachers are, are my students. So it's uh, you know it's win-win. Richard, can you please tell us about day one in your class and uh, what is expected of the students, what is covered? And what's the main idea that you're trying to establish in their minds? Well, that's a lot of a lot of questions. Uh, when you say my class, I teach one class every quarter. I've taught it over a hundred times, um, but I also do teach. Uh, we we're on the three quarter system. We have three ten week quarters here at UCLA, uh, as opposed to the more uh, traditional. Uh, two semesters per academic year. Um, so instead of teaching, a, if I teach a course every semester, it's it's really every quarter. So instead of two times a year, it's three times. 
Um, I also do teach once a, a year a big lecture course, uh, which is a rare uh, film course at UCLA, and that anybody who, even if you're not a film major, anybody on the campus can take that class. Um, but I'm going to assume that we're really talking about the, and that's the fundamentals screenwriting uh, lecture, you know, uh, just explores the, the basic issues that lie underneath um, screenwriting, and it's just a two credit course, one hour a week. So I'm going to assume that by my class, we're really talking about the 434, which is the graduate number in the catalog for an eight credit uh, screenwriting workshop. It's the class I'm going to teach tonight. Uh, there are eight writers around the table, and that's significant that we keep the numbers low so that the, uh, the university and the department and the school and all of the economic pressure um, and all of the heartache over budgets and so on, they've protected us, God bless them, because it's essential that there just be eight writers in that, in that class so that there can be good exchanges among the writers, but also between the writers on one hand and the teacher on the other. Um, and that's just a, a three-hour round table that meets once a week uh, for ten weeks. And um, what I want when of uh, the people who show up the first day is a uh, and uh, I, I don't even want to call it an idea, a notion of what the script is going to be about, um, and to tell me and 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 the other people around the table in two or three or four sentences or two or three minutes, which is longer than it ought to take, to tell me what, you know, tell us what, essentially what you're going to write about. Um, you know, if I, if the movie were Jurassic Park, I would say uh, this scientist discovers that in uh, trapped in amber, you know, from thousands of years ago are uh, mosquitoes that bit dinosaurs from which you can extract the the uh, DNA, you know, of the blood that they left behind and uh, create dinosaurs. And so somebody creates an actual theme park, you know, an island off the Pacific in, um, uh, you know, somewhere in the Pacific that uh, is kind of a theme park, a dinosaur theme park, but with live dinosaurs from years ago um, and all of the complications that ensue. You know, that's what we would do that night. Um, and we would analyze broad notions. And again, everybody, it's not just the professor, but it's a, it's a robust uh, discussion with everybody pitching in and, and uh, you know, talking about the p potential pitfalls, but potential strengths and so on. Uh, everybody does that. That takes up the first night. Then thereafter, for the first four, uh, for the next four nights, twice, uh, in each of the sessions, a student takes an hour and a half first to tell her or his story in detail. Uh, this happens, that happens, that happens, this happens, this happens, that happens, that happens. Not every single detail, but to take a good 15 to 20 minutes to walk you through the movie, uh, describing the actual incidents and anecdotes and events that constitute the story, that constitute the plot. Um, and then there's discussion all about that among then the students will all comment, I will keep quiet, and um, when they're all done, I will comment, and I'll also comment on the comments, and that eats up the next four sessions. Um, by the way, we have eight, nine, ten, even eleven or twelve sections of this class off at every quarter with different instructors, and what they all share is that it's, it's all about writing the feature-length screenplay, but otherwise everybody does it differently. And uh, we think that's really important because it, it compels the writers to find their own voice and their own methodology and their own style and their own personality on the page, uh, rather than to model themselves over a particular mentor. Again, an, an authority who knows the answers. Um, week five, everybody hands in their pages at the end of the session, and I read them very, very carefully and annotate them. I make notes on them. Um, on each and every page, uh, and then week six we we meet uh, not as a class but independently right here in this office one on one. It takes more than the three hours that the class is scheduled. It takes mo much of the day, but we work out a schedule and and I'll review the uh, as much as they've handed in. You know, some will have handed in only six or eight pages. Other will give me forty, fifty, sixty pages. Whatever they've handed in, I will have read during the week 
made notes upon, and then we will uh, be discussing that in very, very close, substantial, intimate detail. The next three weeks, which starts, uh, actually started last week, um, we're doing table readings, the first five pages of the script, really examining the script up up close. It's kind of like um, uh, going into an art gallery. You can uh, look at the painting from the entrance of the gallery and you'll see the whole shape of the thing. But if you're a serious artist or an art lover, uh, a scholar of art, a student of art, um, you might eventually come right up close to that canvas and look at the individual brush strokes and so on. So that's what we're doing kind of at, in, the, in the class. And we can extrapolate certain principles very effectively from the context that they're in, you know, if uh, there's an issue involving parentheticals, for example. Parenthetical is, you know, a, a, usually an adverb between parentheses under the character's name, directing the character uh, as to the way the sh line should be delivered. And I'm against that. I notice that Shakespeare uh, managed to stumble through 36 or 37 plays without any uh, parentheticals. It never says melancholy. Um, so let's say uh, we see in that context somebody has some parentheticals. Uh, well, well, we'll discuss parentheticals when they are appropriate, and sometimes they are, but it's rare why they get in the way uh, and, and how they, they address the issue we were just talking about, the collaborative nature. Maybe the actor has you know, a line that you think might be delivered very effectively this way. It might actually play much more effectively flat and quiet like this, uh, with the emotion therefore being implied uh, by the artist, inferred by the listener, and and the terror, uh, you know, the the um, emotion taking place in the head, where all art should, should play, which is in the head of the viewer, you know, not just video games and computer games are interactive, all art is interactive. Here's the most interactive art of all, reading. I mean, you know, here's ink on, on the page, and you look at this, and somebody's mind, you know, and images and sounds, and if it's done well, aromas and uh, other kinds of sensations emanate from, from that. So that's a long-winded answer to your question, sort of like, what is the... That, that is our bread and butter class. Every writer in this program takes that class at least, uh, I think, four times. Uh, ambitious students take it seven, eight, nine times. So I think somebody once somehow managed to take it eleven times. I don't know how he did that. Um, but that means you get you end up with some scripts to throw away. You know, it, you, every writer needs to, to 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 use some scripts to find her voice, and um, also you have to learn how to not become too attached to to what you do. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've had to explain to people it's just a movie. You know, it's just a movie. People get really kind of suicidal sometimes over some some of the issues that arise. Uh, so that's sort of the way. I don't know if that effectively answers your, your question. I hope it kind of stumbles that way. Richard, every year we understand you have, what, 400 plus screenwriting applicants? Well, they, they're going up. They're rising and they have reached uh, uh, into the 400s uh, over the last several years. Yeah, we don't expect it to go down. Um, so we're wondering how, how we're going to be able to consider all of those applications, but do go on. Well, then we understand you whittle it down to, what is it, 100, and then from there another 50, and then... Right. We uh, we get down to about 100, um, whom we will then interview, um, and we will admit about, we admit about 25 to 30 each year. So if you get to the interview, I mean, if you, that's an incredible thing just to be interviewed. Um, it reflects real uh, upbeat view of your work by the admissions committee, which is to say the faculty. And, um, and even then you only have a one in three or one in four chance of, of really closer to one in four than one in three chance of getting into the into the program. Um, happily, we created, because there are so many writers who are very capable, for whom we just don't have the room, we created some years ago a uh, non-degree program, uh, the professional program in screenwriting at UCLA, and it's um, modeled after this program. It, it, it same faculty for the most part. I don't, I, I lecture in the program and I am the faculty director of the program. Um, 
but mainly it's modeled on the 434 structure um, with a lot, a lot of different instructors, and it's it's configured in such a way as it can to be able to expand to accommodate as many people as are qualified for it because it's not controlled by the region since it's not a degree program we're not giving credit so we're able it's a very good way for us to be able to serve these very very good writers whom we haven't been able to admit simply because uh, we don't have room for them we have um, because people ask me why didn't I get in is my stuff any well, you know my stuff's no good no your stuff is great it's just that we have a uh, more writers with great stuff than we have uh, slots in the in the in the program. What are some of the questions that you're asking these applicants, and what are you looking for? Well, let me uh, let me just answer you this way. There are really four criteria that we uh, look at, but and, and we don't even we don't really care very much about three of them. Uh, we don't care too terribly much about grade point average. Lots of writers aren't great students. I never got great grades in college. I did okay, and now I'm a big shot, super tenured, super senior, you know, college professor. Um, and I have had, uh, uh, you know, I, I wish the the worst student in our program should have my career. You know, that would be a good thing for them. I did uh, support a family, and you know, never have, never had to drive a cab or carry a tray. Well, I when I was a college student, I was a waiter. Um, and there's nothing scandalous or shameful about driving a cab or carrying a tray, but it is nice to actually make a living as a writer. Um, the uh, so we're not very interested in grade point average. We're not very interested in um, test scores, uh, GREs, and whatever they got. Um, again, writers aren't really terribly good uh, test takers. Um, and then we're not terribly interested in recommendations and references, believe it or not, because most of them are pretty much pro forma, you know. Smartest woman in my uh, creative writing class. Um, the uh, A lot of them do seem to be sort of, I mean, we got one from a very, very famous uh, person in the uh, business whom we respect, uh, his initials are Steven Spielberg. It's funny because our students have written 10 projects for Stephen. Jurassic Park 1, Jurassic Park 2, Jurassic Park 3, Indiana Jones 2, Indiana Jones 3, The Terminal, War of the Worlds, Munich, Eagle Eye, Stephen produced Eagle Eye, didn't direct it, and Amazing Stories, which was a whole TV series that he created. He directed some of them. Um, and Stephen uh, recommended a particular writer, but it was uh, in, in one application some years ago. But it seemed pretty pro forma, you know. It looked like it was doing a family favor for a friend. Um, you know, he talked about how bright and what fun and sincere and this and that. And, had, and we did not admit this person. Had he said, had a very prestigious person like Steven Spielberg said, this woman was an, an intern in our office during the Amistad movie, and she sat in on the story conferences and made substantive, substantive uh, contributions to the to issues of dialogue and pro suggested the scene with the blah, 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 that they did it. Well, we would have grabbed her in a second. Um, but that's exceptional that we get something really substantive like that from a prestigious person. So, But if it is a substantive comment from a prestigious person, somebody well known to us and respected by us, that is helpful. But that's the exception. Usually it's, it's pro forma, and it's, sometimes it's even negative. It's astonishing to me. I refuse to write a negative review for anybody. If I absolutely can't support somebody, and this happens every ninth year, you know, it's only happened a handful of times, Somebody asks me for a review and I, I can't provide it. Uh, I'll say to them, "You think I'm the right guy to do this? You know, I won't." But um, others will. Uh, I read re references. I can't imagine why Madeline would ask me to re recommend her. Uh, you know, she uh, showed no um, uh, imagination at all in in the uh, dramatic writing class that we had here at uh, Tulane or wherever it is. Um, and then it, they damn with faint praise, you know, considering her, uh, Herbert's limited ability, 
the uh, B minus he got in my creative writing class represents substantial, uh, 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 you know, effort on his part, and it even gets worse than that. Um, Marvin appears to have uh, uh, successfully challenged his substance abuse issues. He's been sober uh, since two o'clock this afternoon, as near as we're able to uh, figure. I mean, you know, I'm exaggerating, but just a little bit. There's one thing we care. So, so we don't care a lot about grade point average. We don't care about test scores. We don't care a whole lot uh, about recommendations, unless they're again they're prestige people substantively commenting upon the writer. All we really care about is the writing sample. And uh, and uh, most everybody submits screenplays, but you don't have to. We, we, we're looking for two things, good language skills, you know, uh, what about real solid command of the English language, and then evidence of a fertile uh, imagination. We've admitted people on the basis of uh, poetry and um, uh, novels, even ad and catalog copy. Um, it's just as simple as, as that. Everybody has to make a, um, they submit writing samples, they also have to write a personal statement. It's called a statement of purpose. I used to think, my purpose is to get into the stupid program, what do you mean? My, but we've learned over the years that that can be uh, read as a writing sample. People can be very official and um, uh, bureaucratic about it with henceforths and where to for and stuff like that or they can really break your heart uh, with a uh, personal statement about what it is that brought them to uh, to writing. I still remember um, one woman writing that uh, she was the child of a uh, hippie woman who uh, really was very inept as a mother for the first three or four years but then seemed to get it together and got um, a job, but the job was traveling around um, the country showing a line, like a fashion line for a particular designer. And uh, um, so she spent many a uh, Christmas Eve in motels, you know, in, in little towns scattered all around the, uh, uh, the country. However, she still remembers how her mother would decorate if they were gonna to be together on, on um, Christmas Eve, you know, in Akron, Ohio, or somewhere, uh, the mother would go out to the local Five and Dime, the Woolworths, if there was such a thing, and get tinsel and a tiny little tree that would sit on the, you know, the desk in the motel. Um, and they would decorate the room together. They'd put up, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm going to start to cry just describing it to you. It's so touching. And here we are talking about it all these years later. Uh, would we admit somebody like that in a heartbeat? And, you know, she went on to distinguish herself as a really, really good writer. So the writing, the so-called statement of purpose, which the university requires us to seek, we can't just make up the application any way we want. We do have to, you know, fulfill the uh, strictures that are placed upon us by the University of California, properly so. Um, and... Uh, uh, we learn how to see that as an aspect of the writing sample. But again, long-winded answer to your question, the answer is all we really care about is the writing, and that's all we care about. How should someone conduct themselves during the interview? I'm sure many people have tried various <laughs> things, try to win you over with charm and jokes, and others may just be totally silent and stoic. Yeah, we always tell them, don't be nervous. How can they not be nervous? You know, This is not an audition, but of course it is an audition. We're trying to get a sense of what uh, how how effective a member of a community this person could be because film is a community as we said before and also this is a community um, our program is a community and indeed we we have all kinds of superstar writers come right now as we're sitting here we have an alumnus Dustin Lance Black who won the Oscar for Milk a few years ago and he's teaching a class here uh, right now um, why do I mention that? Because we're talking about the nervousness uh, or the aud auditioning. Um, we will tell them uh, they're, uh, you know, it's not an audition, but it, but it really is. Uh, we're trying to get a sense of how um, well they will be able to collaborate, both with the, oh, the point I mentioned 
the reason I mentioned Lance, his name is Dustin Lance Black, but his pals call him Lance, um, is that uh, we will tell the students, like the students who are in his class now, he's not the important guy to meet. Uh, the important people to meet are the people around the table, as he once was. Uh, so in other words, it's like my classmates at USC, uh, uh, there were some very fancy faculty that came and get, took guest shots, but it was the people around the table. I mean, I was sitting around the table with George Lucas and John Milius and Walter Murch and Randall Gleiser and uh, Bob Zemeckis and uh, Caleb Deschanel, the cinematographer, and uh, on and on and on and on, names uh, uh, that you know and names that you don't know. But it's these people that you you're making your relationships with, with whom you will have social relationships with and also professional relationships with down down the line. So um, uh, um, forget exactly what the, what the question was, but it had to do with um, oh, how to conduct yourself in the interview. We're looking for people who who uh, again seem likely to be able to uh, collaborate and cooperate and be a good member of of our own screenwriting community here. Because just as film is a community, as I said before, so also is our little program. We could expand massively. We have so many applications from qualified writers, uh, but we've d deliberately not done that. We think this is the right size. We don't want it to become a, a tuition mill. Uh, it's just the right, we admit about 25 to 30 a year. It's a two-year program. Most About half the people say a third year. So at any given time, there are about 70 people in the program altogether, uh, and there are, um, oh, 65 or 75 people in the program at any given time. But again, each of the classes are just eight writers, so we want those people to be, you know, um, um, generous contributors to those discussions and to support e each other around, around the, the, the table. So we don't really have preset questions or anything like that. We're just kind of having a chat with the people. We don't mind if they... Uh, reveal a conversancy with theater. They want to know who, uh, I like to think they've they've seen a play or two or more by Tennessee Williams. He was actually a guest speaker here in my early days. Imagine Williams in a, in a dramatic writing program. Uh, I mean, it's like being in seminary and God comes in to do a question and answer, you know, and on Thursday at two o'clock, the Lord will be doing a Q&A in the Redwood Room or whatever. It was something like that. We had Billy Wilder as a guest in a. Imagine Billy Wilder guesting in a in a film writing class. I had uh, Neil Simon uh, several times come in. He just lives across the street here. You know, beautiful thing about being in L.A. Um, he came in to talk about comedy writing. I mean, Neil Simon talking to writers about comedy. I just want again. I want to cry because it is so amazing. Um, what what uh, happens here, um, the resources that are available and uh, and all of that. But I'm, the question again was, um, how should, should someone conduct themselves? Should they? Right. It's just a conversation. So you're just judging how they get along in a group, how they interact socially. It's funny because the first thing they're wondering about is should they put on a tie, uh, you know, and a jacket, or come more casual? How how casual is too casual, and so on. And, you know, the question, should I put on a tie, the answer is, I don't know. I really don't know. Uh, it's possible maybe to come, to come too formal. Uh, and I think it's possible to come a little too laid back and a little too uh, um, too familiar. You know, I'd want to air, if I were a student coming for an interview for this program, I'd, I might not put on a tie. I probably wouldn't put on a tie. I mean, I go on TV and on the, all of these political talk shows and I don't wear a tie. Yeah, I wear a jacket and a, uh, I look nice, my wife tells me, which is not an easy uh, compliment to get from my, my bride. Um, but again, these are all questions. We, we just don't know exactly what, what the answer is. We're open to surprises. Um, and I think that the biggest mistake that you can probably make is have a clear agenda. Um, uh, for the meeting, you know, you want to, you're coming in to meet with us and you want to achieve this, 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 and this. I don't think so. I think you just want to come in and meet with the people and hear what they have to say and tell, you know, answer any questions that they have and, and so on. There's no real way to 
real smart way to prepare for it. And I think you could even hurt yourself by over preparing for it. Do you think there's a certain amount of flow? Oh, without question, uh, it, it's all about flow, I, I think. How does the, the conversation flow? It's heartbreaking for us uh, because uh, a lot of the, most of the interviews go quite well, but when it still doesn't mean that you're going to be admitted. In the, the likelihood is that you won't be admitted just as a numbers consideration. There are still more than twice as many people seeking the slots. Than, the, than there are slots, and therefore the likelihood, not just the possibility, but the probability is that you will not be admitted, and, you know, lots of hearts get broken. Uh, lots of people think they're good enough for the program, they're going to admit, and they are good enough for the program. They're not admitted, not because they're not good enough for the program, but because of the these numbers issues, uh, you know, that I was, that I was, was mentioning. Well, they say that L.A. attracts uh, big fish from little ponds. Who says that? Who's this they? Whoever this, this <laughs> metaphorical they is, I'm not sure. Big fish from little ponds. Right, right. Okay. I mean, I'm in town 45 years. I haven't haven't heard that, but go on. <laughs> Maybe it's my own quote, so okay. I'll All right. Okay. Okay. But, but that general sense that a lot of people that come to L.A. were maybe big shots back home in a town of a thousand people. And they come to this town that's beautiful and challenging and fast-paced, and they're going up against 20 versions of themselves, whether as a screenwriter, an actor, a filmmaker, a dancer. What do you say to someone that maybe was used to getting sort of more royal treatment back home and then they come to LA and it's it's a little more of a an eye-opener. You're, you're, you're forced with the fact that you have to wait in line for things. Maybe you're not, you don't have the same prestige as you did in your small college uh, back home. What's your advice to those people? I mean, what, why do you have to say anything or give advice? Say, well, this is something they're going to learn by experience, which is really the only way to learn something and, and, and keep it. Um, they're just going to see that that's the case. You don't have to tell them that. Um, I can see, again, there are hostile people in the arts who would like to put that person down, you know, but uh, I don't um, think uh, discouraging people is is the way to go. Um, and I would never reprimand any such person. Um, they may be, you know, the best writer uh, that ever came out of Canton, Ohio, but, uh, you know, you're, you're here and there is tremendous competition. But you learn about that and in the experience of, uh, of struggling with your art, and you try to do the the best you can. I always tell writers, um, if you're uh, uh, lost and confused and disconnected and frustrated and disappointed, I'm glad to hear it. Not because I'm a sadistic fiend, but to me it says you're having the experiences that writers have. Yesterday, on the front page of the New York Times, big article about Philip Roth. There's no more successful writer than Roth. Um, he's 79 and he's announcing that he stopped writing, at least stopped writing fiction. And um, uh, I wrote down a quote, again, this is on the front page of yesterday, Sunday's New York Times. He says, writing is frustration. It's frustration, not to mention humiliation. That's a verbatim quote. Um, I realize I've actually memorized it now. Um, it says Roth. Roth has had 31 books published, 26 novels published. Um, bunches of them have been made into movies. He's made a great deal of money. He has a beautiful apartment on the Upper West Side. He has a gorgeous home in... in um, Connecticut, uh, in the countryside, um, he's had as much success as any writer has ever had, and he finds it frustrating and humiliating. I mean, that's what art is. It's a, uh, I've never known any artist who was worth anything, who was really, really satisfied with the work that he did, um, who felt comfortable. You know, Mel Brooks, it's my privilege to know him a little bit over the years. He, he, he thinks there's a party going on, and he hasn't been invited. You know, to this day, Brooks. I mean, he's a giant, uh, a, a titan 
in American um, humor and comedy, and film comedy, television comedy. So, um, you know, if you're looking for comfort and to feel good, to feel reassured, this is this is the <laughs> the last place to look. It never changes. My son is a um, he's 26, world's best son, um, and like his grandfather, my father, he's a musician, and he's launched a career. He's trying to break into um, scoring, composing for films and TV and video games and advertisements and so on. And he's just having a sensational success. You know, and how is he making a living? He's making such a living. Um, his mother and I had to beat up on him. Here's a nice problem to have with your kid. To make sure that it goes to the accountant, our tax prepare guy who also does his taxes and make sure that the estimated quarterlies are filed on time. Otherwise he's going to have trouble with the IRS. Now that's the kind of, <laughs> the kind of dilemma you'd like to confront with your kid over your kid. Why am I mentioning this? Because one thing he doesn't seem to get yet is that it never, you know, he he's working very hard. He has a lot, a lot of work and I'm always telling him a little too much work and I'm always telling him to better too much than too little. Um, and things have a way of shaking down and, you know, filling up the time that that's for them. If he had less work, he'd still use all of that time to do to do the work. But what he can only get through experience is the understanding that it's always frustrating and, and difficult. It never comes easy, not for any practitioner. I have a lot of experience myself as a as a writer. I don't consider myself a terribly important writer. But I am a much experienced writer, and I've worked in all of the uh, all of the media. You know, I've worked for all. I've written feature length scripts uh, for all of the studios, the major studios, and many independent production companies. And I've um, had five books published, including best-selling nonfiction and uh, and and fiction. My last novel was a Times bestseller for one week. Not a small thing. Um, so from my own experience, but not only my own experience, because my experience as an educator allows me, working very closely with other artists on their own work, uh, I kind of learn from their experience as well. And that's the way it is. It's always difficult. It never gets easy. It's like losing weight. People who uh, um, uh, have weight issues often think if they could just get the the 30 to 40 pounds off, the 45, 55 pounds they need to lose, if they could just get that off, then they could stop obsessing about this and stop worrying about this. But it doesn't work that way. Uh, if you want to keep the weight off, you got to worry about it every day. I'm, um, I, I like to, to think that I'm fit. Uh, why is that? Because I, ever, you know, I never go on a diet. Life is my diet. Um, every day, day I go to the pool, you know, you sit, you're on your butt in your chair as a writer, you know, you gotta get out. You, you, actors and dancers, singers understand the instrument, the body is your, your body is, that's your instrument, you gotta take care of it. Writers don't understand that as well sometimes. Um, you gotta take care of yourself and you have to stop uh, looking for satisfaction and um, uh, calm regarding, you know, your your work. I never knew any writer who's really, really successful who wasn't uh, uh, unhappy with the way stuff came out. I just, um, you know, Julius Epstein, who wrote uh, Rest His Soul, he's gone now, but uh, I met him a few times. He would gripe and cough about how they ruined Casablanca. Uh, he was he wanted it to be this way and his brother had an idea for this, but oh no and that and that, there he is all these years later Talking about how they wreck Casablanca. It's not really that good. He doesn't think Casablanca If only somebody would wreck my movie like they wrecked Casablanca Woody Allen I read an interview some time ago with Woody Allen and they said uh, When you look back at your last uh, at, You know you look back at your previous movies your early movies and Woody said stop they said, what's the matter? They said, I don't. I don't look back at my early movies. I don't look back at any of my movies. And they said, well, surely you've you've pulled Annie Hall off the shelf over the last 40 years and taken a peek. Manhattan, seen at least some of it. He said, no, not one frame. Why not? And he said, because he hates everything about them. And now Manhattan 
and Annie Hall are two of the best movies ever made, in my view. Um, and here he is, the guy who, who wrote and directed them. Wish you know, who, he says, "All I see is stuff I wish I had done differently." Um, I never knew anybody who had a, a different attitude about it by that. You know, there's a very famous book. Uh, miss it, it's called Adventures in the Screen Trade, uh, William Goldman, and um, Goldman, usually successful writer, and its most famous line, the most famous line in the book is, um, nobody knows nothing, because um, it really is, this is a business where the exception is the rule, and uh, you just never know how it, it's going to come out, but there's a much better line in that book, it seems to me, that is overlooked by most people. He's at a meeting, Sidney Pollack and uh, the, the late director is at the meeting, and he wants, he, Pollack wants to do a script that um, Bill has written, and they're talking to the money guy in a restaurant, and it's not going well. They're not, you can see it's not, this guy's just not interested in that film, the, you know, too risky, too whatever, he doesn't want to do it. And as it starts to get worse and worse, uh, and this is as described by uh, Goldman, Sidney, Sidney Pollack says, wait a second, and he reaches for the script, and he, and Pollock real, uh, Goldman realizes, oh my God, oh no, he's actually going to now read to the investor, the potential investor, a passage from the script. And this horrifies Goldman, and he has the line that I'm focusing on, which is, now you have to understand, I hate everything I've ever written. That's William Goldman. He wrote Butch and Sundance, for God's sake. Uh, you know, hugely, hugely successful writer. There can't be, there are writers as successful as Bill Goldman, but none more so. And uh, artists should not look back at their at their work, and uh, if they do, they're going to be disappointed in it. Um, I uh, have had a lot, a lot of praise on some of the things that I've done. Uh, certainly my last novel, as I say, was a uh, uh, made the Times bestseller list and uh, is in action, uh, potential film rights um, sale uh, right now potentially happening and um, my screenwriting book has been in in print for a uh, you know, quarter of a century uh, and won a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of praise. When I pick up those books occasionally and just open them up to the middle to take a look around. Boy, all I see is mistakes, uh, poorly um, uh, stated um, notions, uh, clumsy diction, um, awkward phraseology. Uh, you know, it's just constantly, I'm just constantly wincing. And this is stuff that a lot of people have, uh, you know, Lance Black, I just mentioned, uh, blurbed it, said it was really, really a uh, very fine book. To my astonishment, he clearly read it. Uh, David Kep, uh, who's a hugely successful writer and a, uh, an alumnus uh, who studied UC screenwriting at UCLA, uh, praised it to the skies and um, many, many other people, but I don't, you know, I, can, I don't really, you know, I can barely tolerate it. And I think that's um, common. I think that's pretty common among successful artists. Uh, and uh, they should not look back, but, but forward. We watched a documentary entitled The Making of Citizen Kane. Uh -huh. And one of the gentlemen interviewed said, for Orson Welles, his greatness was really his downfall. That Meaning? He, that he had been praised for, from a young age and, and great things were expected of him and, and the keys to the studios were basically handed to a 24-year-old boy, pretty much. And he threw caution to the wind, this gentleman felt. So can someone be too flippant with things? Too, too yeah, parents? I think it's very difficult. Uh, I, I am one of those people. It's so boring for a film professor to say this, but I think Citizen Gain is the greatest movie ever. I really do. And not because it teaches you great lessons about film or, you know, it, the way it handles the spatialization of time and the dynamization of space and the juxtaposition of imagery and all the fancy film talk. It's just a great story. It's just such a compelling story. And it uses the medium 
so phenomenally well. I remember at, when I was a student at SC, uh, Lynn Dunn, the special effects guy, came in and showed how they they did the special. There's a lot of special effects in Kane, and they're very primitive compared to computer graphics today and, and uh, involving all kinds of tricks in the lab, uh, high contrast and, and uh, bypacking uh, the, uh, uh, the film and printing and then printing from the tail end and all kinds of very, very complex um, stuff. Um, I mean, it's just the, the way it uses the medium is, is astonishing. Uh, and his success was so triumphant that it seems to have hurt him. You know, he really didn't handle it ter terribly well. He's not really sufficient. He was disciplined enough there, but afterwards kind of lost control of, of the discipline. Talent is hugely overappreciated. You do need talent, but much more uh, important than that is discipline. And discipline means time. It means giving giving the time to the thing and and, and not hurrying. And uh, he does seem to have. Uh, I mean, it's a tragic story. I'll tell you, he he was supposed to teach here, Wells, and would have had he not died. Um, he was all set to teach, and um, the dean then uh, told me that he said to him, "So you already did for your class." And they said, uh, well, he's kind of nervous about it, but he, he's as ready as he can be, but he's kind of nervous. He said, why, you've, what's to be nervous about? <laughs> you, you, Russell Wells, you've, you've surely taught before. He said, no, never, I've never ever taught this is the first time. And they said, really? You never wanted to teach before? And he said, um, uh, almost shamefacedly, uh, that, no, that wasn't it. The problem was nobody had ever asked him, they'd never invited him to teach, kind of like the, you know, the prettiest girl at the dance, they don't, the guys don't think she'll dance with them, you know, so they, nobody asks her to dance or something like that. He was a, a uh, I mean, here, here he is, uh, I have a picture of him up here, so there he is, I mean, just to look at this man, you can see he's committing suicide there, he, I mean, he, he must weigh close to 400 pounds in that picture. Um, he can barely breathe, he's obviously full of of disappointment and self-loathing and a very, very self-destructive guy. Um, so uh, to be a great artist doesn't mean you have to be that way. Um, but to be a great artist doesn't mean you, if, if your art falls into place, that your life will fall into place. So uh, I don't know what, you know, it's anybody's guess really what happened to him. Uh, George Lucas had a triumphant success when he was still in his 20s. He was already a millionaire when he turned 30. Um, and he still managed to do gigantically creative stuff uh, for many years to come. And I, I, I'm sure you know he just sold his company for, uh, I love it, $4.05 billion. Even just the point oh five is $50 million. Um, so I don't think, now he's kind of a haunted guy. In recent years, I see George smiling. I think he he adopted some boys 10, 12, 15 years ago, started to make a life for himself. I know from personal contacts and people who know him and so on that um, he really genuinely hated running the empire. It was like a trap um, called it Fortress Lucas. Uh, you know, very isolating and um, uh, it can't, you know, it can't be easy to, to have that kind of success. Some people handle it better than others. Uh, if you look at most pictures of, of George up to about 15 years ago, he looks, I mean, I could show you bios here in my bookshelves where they have picture sections where he's, um, you know, at the, on the set at Star Wars and so on, and it looks like he's about to be let off for execution, you know. Uh, he just seems seems terribly, desperately unhappy. Um, but certainly he's disciplined in ways that, that Wells was not um, and managed, I think, to stay successfully creative in ways that uh, Wells was, was not able. But I don't think it flows necessarily from the success that it has to be that way. Um, I mean, Steven Spielberg has had a, a unparalleled success who's more expensive, uh, successful than Steven. Expensive, too. Um, and he seems to, uh, you know, he had once marriage that, that kind of stuttered, but, uh, you know, his current marriage is 30-something years. Uh, 
Uh, I uh, only met him once. I don't know him. Uh, I only know of him. But uh, everybody I know who knows him, and indeed I have a lot of students, former students have written for him and know him real well. He seems to, uh, despite his success, to be a very happy guy, if, if I could put it that way. Um, as happy as an artist can be. I mean, you know, artists are haunted by the, the need that they have, not just the desire to create and make new statements. If you're as successful as Stephen, you've got to be, you're going to engender a lot of jealousy. A lot of people are going to want to take pot shots at you and so on. Uh, I just saw Lincoln and I was at a screening at the Guild and Tony Kushner was there. Kushner. I don't know about you, but I thought Angels in America was a triumph, just a most amazing play. My brother-in-law won the Tony. He's an actor uh, for the in the Roy Cohn part. Pacino plays it in the movie. Um, uh, Lincoln, it's a triumph. I, you know, I'm notorious for hating all movies, and I don't hate all movies. I just hate most movies. I mean, most art is pretty bad, but um, it's worth it. You see something like um, Lincoln. Uh, and it's worth sitting through 15 stupid movies uh, to see something that really is transforming uh, like like Lincoln. And that's pretty bold. Stephen can do whatever he wants. Um, uh, this is a real reach, a real... I mean, he's he's inviting all kinds of risk. He's, he, he's not playing it safe. He appreciates that the most hazardous thing you can do in art is to play it safe. Uh, so uh, I don't think it follows that great success requires you you know disappointment in in later careers it just happens from time to time wells has a unique story i don't know the whole story of his life but you know i'm my wife is a psychotherapist uh, in private private practice for many years and uh, i uh, tend to think the book is maybe it's her influence um, but I think the book is written early. It has to do with how uh, you came to feel about yourself as a child, and that has a lot to do with uh, the parenting and and so on. You know uh, um, that it's not success that brings brings people down. Uh, some people handle success very very well. You know, getting your butt into the chair and your hands on the keys, um, and seeing where it goes. I believe you have to have an outline. Um, but then you got to like throw away that outline. Um, it will uh, uh, take paths that are surprises to the uh, the artist that created it. I've never known anybody who uh, ever wrote anything that wasn't surprised, who wasn't surprised by di lines of dialogue that the characters seem to invent by themselves and twists and turns in the story. Uh, I remember asking Neil Simon, "Do you laugh at your own jokes?" And he said, sure, I do the first time I hear them. And I think that's fantastic that he actually hears them. It's as if somebody else is telling them, telling these jokes to him. And that's the experience, I think, of a lot of artists. Uh, it's not, I, I wrote a Twilight, I sold a, a Twilight Zone episode years and years ago about a, a muse. It's a, sort of a, a composer of commercial jingles and his muse. Uh, that proposes, if I, I'll spare you the story, if I told you the story, you'd think, hey, what a good story. Um, but they, uh, the, the thesis underneath it was the notion that muses don't desert their artists. It's really the other way around. You have to be available. Uh, it's never easy to get in into. Uh, and you have to own that. You have to know that. Uh, I'm not sure that answers what's the first thing you do. Usually something occurs to you that seems kind of odd, you know, imagine if this happened or that happened. Remember when our first child was going to be born, uh, we went to birth classes, you know, birth preparation classes, and, uh, which were held at Cedars um, Sinai, and everybody was supposed to bring a pillow. So suddenly outside, you know, near Beverly uh, Boulevard near uh, San Vicente, whatever it is, like all of these um, couples, all of the women are quite pregnant, and everybody's carrying pillows. You know, what's that about? Uh, imagine, you know, you're waiting, you drive past a bus stop, and there's like 60 people at the bus stop, and they all have accordions. I don't know, they all got accordions for some reason. What could that be, and how could that, you start to think about that. 
um, and also you don't think about it, you just sort of like let it simmer and, and cook and maybe a notion will come to you uh, and that you start to play with it uh, and, and, and see how it unfolds. I know there are uh, other people, including people you're talking to, I'm sure, who have much more precise steps. Uh, I reject that in my own work and in the work of the writers that I know. Uh, again, I think uh, that it's a, um, uh, a function of surprise, a lot of art is, and the, the important thing for the artist is to stay open to those surprises rather than try to drag the narrative back to some previous intellectual preconception that you had. The very first script I ever wrote, and I never did sell it, I wrote it in class, like my own class, except it was Crosstown with Erwin R. Blacker, legendary teacher of screenwriting, now long deceased, but he taught George and Milius and all of these people. Um, and um, uh, I wrote a story based loosely on an experience that I'd had when I'd worked in the project uh, Head Start, the pilot Head Start program, the uh, War on Poverty, a Lyndon Johnson program having to do with uh, support for preschoolers in the schools. And there was one social worker who, um, a white guy, advantaged and privileged guy, but he kind of like would speak with a sort of a fake black accent, a streety kind of black jab, you know, hey bro, what's going on? You know, And he thought that uh, uh, that really impressed the, the black kids he was working with. He was not working with little kids in Head Start, he was working with adolescents in another program. Um, and the establishment, the people who ran that program thought, boy, this guy really goes the extra mile. I thought he's an idiot. He's just patronizing and condescending. You know, I'm a Jew. Imagine somebody trying to make points with me by speaking with a Yiddish accent. No, Richard was Will too. You know, like I would think, whoa, what a, what a cool guy this is, talks the talk. Well, this guy got killed. Uh, he was murdered. And I uh, thought that's something to write a script about. Uh, when I wrote the script, I thought it was the social worker's story, the white kid's story, but when I got done, it was really the black kid's story, and I didn't realize that until I was done with the first draft. And the smartest thing I did was to leave it alone uh, in that regard, that is to say, I rewrote it several times, but I let it become the black kid's story, which is a much more interesting story. The white guy was a subsidiary character, now not the protagonist of the piece. Um, I never sold that script, but I did get representation. I got top representation. I got assignments. I got on staff at Universal. A lot of uh, writers don't get it that when a script doesn't sell, that's not the end. It's just the beginning. There's all kinds of rewards that can flow from the script that doesn't sell. Also, a script that doesn't sell now might sell, you know, down the line. Clint Eastwood made um, Unforgiven, which won the Oscar for Best Screenplay, Best Movie, uh, about 20 years after he acquired that script. Uh, yeah, so so you you never you never really know, but what was the point? Um, talking about oh uh, again, if you if a first draft, you put all the work you put into a first draft, and you end up realizing that the guy that you thought was protagonist isn't the protagonist. It's not his story at all. Some other, that's not a waste. That's not that shouldn't be frustrating. That's a really good use of that draft. You'll salvage some of the stuff in the draft. But also you'll have used it to kind of point you in the direction that you need to go. You can't figure it out in advance. You just can't. Kushner at the Lincoln screening, have you seen it? You, you, uh, maybe you won't like it at all, but I think it's impossible not to be astonished by how engaging it is and important it is in the best sense of important. Um, and, uh, uh, and it is a stupendous screenplay by Kushner. <clears throat> and, and Tony was saying, a lot of people think you think the thing up in your head and then you write it down. But he says the writing down of it is sort of the thinking of it, that there's a nexus between the pen or the keyboard, the hands on the keyboard that kind of create it. And you just never know. And you have to live with that uncertainty. Uh, you have to sort of rejoice and, and, and celebrate and embrace that uncertainty instead of um, trying to eliminate the uncertainty. You look at the... the the studios today are what's less interesting than what they're doing now. They're doing prequels and sequels and items of franchises. What they're trying to do is minimize risk. Um, they're trying to 
make it so that when an audience goes to see a movie, they get what they expected. But when I go to the movies, I don't want to see what I expected. I want my expectations to be exceeded. I want to be turned upside down. I want to be frightened. I want to. I want my life to be changed forever. It's funny. I I, I um, lectured September a year ago. Uh, to a an evangelical Christian conference in Chicago, 500 pastors from all across the nation <clears throat> on narrative in Scripture. I was never more warmly greeted or uh, generously received. They also paid me very well, uh, but I never had a better time. You know, I mean, I've given hundreds of of speeches uh, all around the world. I never had a better time than I did in Chicago with all these sweet Christians. And uh, one of the things I told them was, if you want to keep people in the church, even after they leave the church on Sunday morning, uh, that is to say they should think about the sermon. If you want them, just like if they leave your movie, thinking about it. I mean, I'm still thinking about Lincoln. I saw it over a week ago, and it's still playing in my head. Um, and the more time that passes, the more I'm into it, not less. It's not fading. It's getting stronger. I'll probably see it again. Um, the, uh, oh, what is the point? The, um, uh, uh, oh, the, yeah, the, the Christians, um, if you want people to stay in the movie, uh, just like if you want them to stay in the church, what I told them was, you don't need to make people feel good, you just have to make them feel. Scare them half to death make them cry, you know. Imagine, I remember walking out of a theater in Westwood and the doors, I, I was walking down the street past the theater and the doors opened and people started to stream out. It had just broken. And I saw somebody I knew, but there were a lot of people between us. And I sort of indicated, you know, we waved, hey, hi, you know, and then uh, I pointed to the marquee and shrugged. Meaning, so what do you think? By this time, he was able to get up to me, and he said, "Oh, um, it's a, a good, it's a worthy movie. That I certainly think you should see." And I said, um, "You know what I said earlier? Like, uh, uh, I, you know, this doesn't make me very popular with people when I tell them what they thought of a movie, or they tell me what they thought of a movie, and I tell them, no, that's not what you thought. What you thought was such and such. Uh, I understand that that's pretty arrogant." Um, but what can I tell you? I'm just reporting honestly on what I, on my own reaction. And I said to this guy, you won't be surprised. You know, I said, you know what? I hear you saying it's a worthy movie, but it seems like my impression is you didn't like this movie. Now I want you to imagine instead of the uh, the, the picture breaking and people streaming on the street, but they're all crying. Everyone is sobbing with stre tears streaming down their faces. Um, well, you wouldn't want to see that movie, would you? The hell you wouldn't. You'd immediately go to see that movie. You'd stop. You'd stand up your date, your next appointment, and you'd get in line to see that movie if it could affect people so uh, so strongly. The biggest mistakes starting out, and how did you correct them? <laughs> oh, your that's script. a great question. Biggest mistakes starting out. Um, I suppose... Uh, you know, I was very lucky. I, I got work quite consistently for a number of years, and I thought, so that's the way it is, you know. And I realized that um, in Hollywood, every um, uh, every success is just just moves you up to the next level of, of, of the possibility of frustration and disappointment and heartache. You know, you write a script, you don't sell it. You sell the script, they don't make the movie. They make the movie, but it doesn't get released, or it gets released poorly, or it's not well received. Um, if it's well received, they'll talk about what a great director it was. If it's uh, uh, if it bombs, they'll say, "Well, you know, how could he work with that script?" And, and, and so on. It's writers are for to to blame. But I must say, I don't, I uh, I can't think of any really profound mistakes uh, that uh, I can identify that I made. I think. Um, uh, the smartest thing that I did, the, the anti-mistake I made was to come to Hollywood. Uh, you know, I only, I thought I was going to come here for, I came here for about three weeks. I had time to kill between the two, uh, between my master's degree, which I got at Syracuse, the Newhouse School, 
and I was going to continue there for a PhD. And I uh, came out here, drove out in three days with a buddy in a VW Beetle in 1966, and um, sort of got shamed into staying. I realized, my God, uh, the, when I, you know, the opportunities to study film were much better in here at UCLA and at USC, where I was, than at Syracuse. And the mistake I would have made would have been to play it safe, and because I had everything all set up there and was comfortable, and um, you know, I realized I'm too young to go go for comfort. Um, so I'm not aware of of uh, I can't really identify mistakes, things I really wished I had done differently, based on what I knew at least at at the time. I mean, I could, like with American Graffiti, I never really, uh, you know, it's not unusual that there's a uh, credit arbitration. It's automatic in a case like Graffiti where you have a production executive, in this case, the director, George Lucas, the Guild automatically has an arbitration um, and uh, regarding the credit. And, uh, I, you know, I, I never made my case. I never took it, took it seriously. The fact is, I did very well off of graffiti, even without my name on it. I got, um, uh, I became the go-to guy for uh, adolescent coming-of-age stories. I mean, I wrote such stories, commissioned assignments, you know, good, good pay. The equivalent today of like, uh, adjusted for inflation would be like half a million dollars a script. You know, not the kind of money that it used to be, but, you know, I was really 20-something years old and, uh, um, I mean, a, a, a school teacher in, in the LAUSD, the Los Angeles Unified School District, back then made about $7,000 a year. And you could live kind of comfortably on that in LA in those days, you know, talk about the early 70s, late 60s. Um, so I made it, you know, uh, I, I was able to, uh, uh, I was well paid for the work that I did on American Graffiti and, uh, and uh, got a lot of work as a result of that. It also inspired me to do my own coming-of-age story. When George approached me on graffiti, the first thing I did was say, who cares about your Gentile, white bread, Modesto, cornflake uh, uh, upbringing? You know, let's do my story, Jews, New York, doo-wop. Because um, I had a project that I wanted to do. And of course, he wanted to do his own story. You can't fault him for that. But after that all came out, I decided I really ought to do the. the I never seriously expected he was going to, you know, do anything other than his own story. That's all he should have done, of course. But after that, I um, I was inspired that I should try my own, and I wrote my first novel. Um, I I had it as a film treatment, but instead I used it as an outline for a novel. I think there was a strike, and you couldn't market to the studios. And that was very naive because the fiction market is impossible, especially the first fiction market. But the thing sold immediately. So naivete is your friend. Sometimes you can outsmart yourself. It's a real problem. Sometimes in film schools, the students are too aware of the grosses from last week and the trends. I'm always telling them it's too late to get in on a trend. First of all, there aren't any trends. But if there was a trend, um, it's too late to get in on the trend because it's the trend. It had to have been in the works a couple of years earlier, three years earlier. Um, so, uh, as I say, uh, the the novel the novel sold right away to a major publisher, a New York publisher. Uh, then suddenly it was viable as a movie deal, and there was a uh, film rights sale and the adaptation assignment. So. Um, you know, I made uh, good money and had good experiences. Would you know that I'm, believe it or not, I'm still, even as we sit here, I'm in business on that same project. Forty years later, it's now, after I saw Jersey Boys, I decided to turn it into a jukebox musical. Um, a, uh, 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 a jukebox musical is a musical that uses not original tunes, but mu music of the era, hits of the era, like Jersey Boys does. And um, lo and behold, we uh, we had a uh, staged reading of it here in the musical theater department, our sister department, the theater department. That was a very humble experience, but for me, the most exciting uh, creative experience I've ever had. 
and now there's an agent who has it and who's taking it around and trying to make a deal for it. Uh, it's very unlikely that anything will come of it, but uh, the nice thing for me is I'm still in business with it. I have enough money. I'm not rolling in dough, but I have more money than I need. I don't worry about money. To me, that's what being rich means. It means not worrying about money. Um, so I'm liberated from needing to make the rent or anything like that. And uh, again, it's a, it's a wonderful example of how you, you know, Socrates says, I'm a college professor, so I'm required once a day to quote Socrates, so please make a note that this is for today. Uh, the real wisdom is knowing that you don't know. Like Goldman says, you, nobody knows nothing. You just don't know. What if somebody told you they wanted to do a movie um, and they didn't know much about it, but they thought it should be about a guy who stutters and he has to give a speech and so he hires a speech therapist and they prepare for his speech and then he gives the speech. I mean that sounds like the stupidest movie I ever heard of and yet it's a great movie. I love the King's Speech and it won the Oscar for best movie and best screenplay. What if somebody told you, uh, what if in my class somebody says I want to do a, s a silent movie in black and white, you know, this guy's crazy. And yet, that's the Oscar-winning movie this year. So you just never know. You never know. One thing I've learned in business is, is you just don't know. That I think is the most important thing of all. And again, it can become a handicap in an institution of learning, because here we're supposed to be able to figure everything out, and see how it works. And some of the pundits and people you're talking to really believe they have the formulas that explain this and that and why this and so on. What about it? it's just an accident. What about it can't be explained? There's a lot of stuff I think that just can't be explained. Why do you need to explain everything, you know? Art is not about... Ex explaining is a intellectual, a head, a brain thing. Uh, and that's a very important part of our lives, but art is not about that. Art is about the heart and the belly and the groin and um, and not about thoughts, but about feelings. And um, again, if you can make an audience feel something intensely, uh, if you can frighten them, if you can uh, make them gr deeply, deeply sad, cause them to grieve, um, boy, they will line up around the block to see that movie because so much of our lives are boring. Thank God, we you know we want sweet boredom in our lives. Somebody said, my wife and I flew, uh, we were in, we went in Portland for a wedding, and we got back, somebody said, how was the flight? And we said, boring, meaning terrific, you know, I mean, would you like, oh, it was a great flight, uh, you know, there was a near miss when we left the airport in Portland, and uh, we hit bad weather over Yosemite Park, and um, uh, then there was an accident on the runway, uh, of a couple of vehicles that we, we just about, uh, we had a scooter, I mean, you know, like, uh, the, the, the oxygen masks came down, there was a lot of uh, uh, turbulence, I mean, you know, that's not what you want in your life, you want that in, in your art. What you want in your life on the flight is it took off right on time, uh, you know, they served tomato juice with no ice, my beverage of choice on these flights, and then it landed without a vent in... Uh, you know, at LAX or Burbank or wherever we came into. Um, you want boredom in your life. You want excitement and and um, other kinds of stuff um, in your art, because that's a safe place to experience that. And um, I think that's what it, it's really for. The theater is really kind of a gymnasium for the senses. It's a place where you go to try out uh, really, you know, experiences and and emotions that in the real world might destroy you. You know, you can actually kind of... So it's not just a digression and a diversion, it's really an important part of learning how to engage the uh, the world. Richard, I would imagine a majority of your students here are in the class, in the program, because they want to be professional screenwriters. They want to make their living as such. What's the likelihood that any of them will do this? Grimm, first of all, uh, 
among the writers who come into our program who want to be successful, a, a majority of them is 100% a majority. I mean, every one of them wants to be a successful professional, and that's what we want them to be. We are a professional school, and our great uh, uh, success is their success. Um, they're doing fabulously well uh, in, in all media now. Uh, indeed, on the, I mentioned that I was in a flight to Portland. I went with the family to Hawaii, and we also went to New York. Uh, so that's four flights, you know, two round trips. On each one, there was a movie written by a student, uh, a f an alumnus from the program, and several television episodes. You know how they run out of them. They finish the movie and there's still time, so they run some TV uh, episodes of old series and so on. And they're all, they're all, and all my commandos who were sitting in the classes just a few years ago, and that is gratifying. They all want to be, be professionals. That's what we uh, want them to be. Uh, so what is the question? Why? What's the likelihood? Oh, what's the likelihood? I was saying um, uh, you have to assume it's not going to work out. Um, God is watching. If if she sees you take it for granted that uh, it's going to work out, then it's not going to it's not going to work out. Um, if you need certainty, uh, you shouldn't even start this. If you need to know for sure that you'll succeed at it, you just have to get into the stream and hope for the best. Uh, and at the at the end of the day, let everybody uh, else betray you and and shortchange you and let you down. But at least you be true to yourself and keep the writing coming. You got you got to crank the stuff out. You have to keep the stuff coming. That's the most important the most important part of it. Um, yeah, I mean, listen. What is a writer trying to do? She's trying to literally trade her daydreams for dollars. Writer, you know, she's trafficking in her own imagination. Uh, uh, you know, writers get scolded for what other, I'm sorry, other people get scolded for writers, for what writers get praised for, and that is daydreaming. Um, uh, what could be better than that, you know, to literally uh, live by your wits? Uh, so a lot of people are going to compete for it, and it's going to be difficult to uh, succeed at that. But at the end of uh, your life, let everybody else have let you down. But at least you be a warrior for your for yourself. We do rejoice in an embarrassment of riches here. We do see our students, for the most part, succeed and have uh, successful professional lives. But um, I like to think that they don't really expect that. They certainly don't take it for granted that that will come to pass. If they do, they will they will not succeed. At what stage of the screenwriting process would you say it's time to start thinking about selling it? At no stage. You should never think of it. That's why we have agents. Uh, it's funny, I, at my class, the class which meets tonight, in the first class I always brag about all of the scripts that got um, written in the class that became movies. Now most of the people who succeed don't sell the scripts that they uh, write in the class, much less have them made into movies. They use them as showcases. They win representation. They win development deals. and rewrite assignments and other kinds of, of uh, rewards. Um, but there are some that have actually been written right in the classes that became movies. Um, and uh, I brag to the eight writers around the table about those. First thing I do. The next thing I do is I tell them, now please don't try to sell the scripts that you write in this class. And then I take a long silence. Uh, and I let people think about what seems like a contradiction. I've just been bragging about all the scripts that have sold out of the class, and here I am saying, please don't try to sell the scripts that you read in the class. And I point out to the student that you write in the class, and then I point out to the writers uh, that it's not a contradiction. I didn't, sell, don't, I didn't say don't sell the scripts that you write in the class. I said don't try to sell the scripts that you write in the class. If you're thinking about the sale while you're working on it, you are doomed. You are lost. Um, you're uh, intellectualizing, you're calculating, you're getting in all kinds of uh, um, processes that are uh, that will militate against successful art. You're getting again too intellectual, too into your head when you think that way. You start to think about trends, what's popular, who might this be right for. Um, I once had a writer who'd been admitted to the program. It's extremely unusual that somebody's admitted and doesn't enter the program. Our so-called take rate, the percentage of people who are admitted who actually enroll is like 99%. Um, but there was one guy who came to me with a rude yellow legal pad. He'd been admitted. He wasn't sure he wanted to come and he wanted to know the 
uh, percentage of students that had agents after how much time, the median income for graduates at the five-year mark, the ten-year mark, uh, not only the uh, median but the mean and also the average. I, I resisted telling them the mean and the average are the same. The median is different, but the mean and the average, uh, those are two synonyms. Um, and I said to him, I said, I could get all of those statistics for you that would show you, you know, that this is the, the best way to succeed in the movie business uh, to become a writer is to come to this program. I said, but I don't, I'm not going to do that for two reasons. The second reason, first, the second reason is I'm the professor. I give the assignments. I don't do the assignment. I mean, he's giving me all these <laughs> assignments, you know, and hey, I got tenure. I, I, I dish it out. I don't take it anymore. Uh, but first of all, I said to him, I don't think you will succeed. Um, and I, I hope I, will, I didn't say this cruelly. I said it truthfully. I said, I do not believe that you will succeed. If you come through this program, I, uh, if you enter this program, um, we've admitted you. We will welcome you warmly and we will treat you generously. But I don't think you're going to succeed. Uh, and he said, why do you think? I said, because you're sitting here asking me with a little yellow pe legal pad, asking me about the median and the mean and the average and the dem and who has the agent and the dem. What about story and, and character and dialogue and stuff like that? Themes, uh, lessons, uh, the, the sorts of, of things that, that come out of art, you know. Uh, you're already focusing on uh, um, the future and how things are going to stack up, um, they're probably not going to stack up, you know, and, and I was serious, this was not reverse psychology trying to, you know, convince them to, to come, we, whenever anybody, uh, there's two kinds of questions I, I never answer, one is, uh, should I pursue this, you know, uh, the, well, the answer is no, if you have to ask, then you shouldn't do this, um, it's too frustrating, again, Philip Roth, yesterday's New York Times, writing is frustration, it's frustration, not to mention humiliation, quote, close quote, Roth, this isn't some newcomer trying to make his way through the publishing business, this is the superstar author of, of the 31 books, bestseller after bestseller after bestseller after bestseller, movie deals up the wazoo, and he says it's frustration and humiliation, and don't go into it if there's something else that you can do. It's kind of crazy. It's not smart. I mean, I mentioned that my dad was a bass player. He had great success, made a lot of money. And what was he doing? He was dragging horse hair, which is what the bow is made out of. It's the tail of a horse, a violin bow or, or a bass bow, across sheep gut. Uh, the strings are made out of the intestines of sheep. And uh, imagine doing that for a living, dragging horse hair across sheep cut so that it makes a sound and then claiming that you think people will pay to hear this sound. They'll line up in the snow and wait outside for hours to pay big money to sit in a chamber where for a couple of hours women and men uh, will do that, will, you know, blow air through tubes like flutes and clarinets and so on. And um, I mean, we were, I mentioned we were at the Philharmonic on Saturday. There's a guy beating a timpani, and somebody doing bells. Uh, you know, this is like, we had so-so seats, so they would cost $230 the pair, you know. I mean, it's crazy. Art's not smart. It's kind of dumb. And um, if you're really, really smart, you don't go into it. This is not for really, really smart people. Um, you got to be dumber if, than that if you want to succeed in, in creative expression. You got to be a little crazy.